The Old Testament reading comes from Genesis, chapters 2 and 3. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, when no plant of the field was yet in the earth, and no herb of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was no one to till the ground. But a stream would rise from the earth and water the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it or you will die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate, and she gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. For the word of God in scripture for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. It is gathering Sunday, and while we cannot gather in person, what we can do is gather ourselves up in the story of God and ground ourselves once again in our God-given identity and purpose. Today begins our second year with the Narrative Lectionary, a four-year cycle of texts that takes us through a range of specific stories in the Old and New Testaments so that we can see the narrative arc of how God is at work in God's people so that we can proclaim the good news that God creates us with love, teaches us how to love, calls us to love, empowers us to love, forgives us when we fail to love, and gives us infinite second chances to try and try again. In the beginning, Bereshit. It's the first word in the book of Genesis. Genesis is our origin story, our beginning. Sometimes, especially when we feel lost, we need to go back to the beginning to see if we can reorient ourselves and reground ourselves. And the middle of a global pandemic and two months away from a critical national election feels like as good as time as any to get grounded, doesn't it? Well, our grounding begins in a garden, the Garden of Eden. We know this story well 
And there's probably part of this story that we know so well that we actually don't even know that what we know isn't part of the original story at all. It's like the game of telephone where you pick a phrase and pass it down the line. You know, one person whispers to the next, snake in the grass. And as it passes along, it becomes skate in the grass, spade in the grass, splayed in glass, sprayed with gas, played and gasped, prayed and fast. And all of a sudden, the Garden of Eden becomes the Garden of Gethsemane, with Jesus on his knees, praying and fasting, instead of a snake in the grass, eyeing some fruit. Biblical interpretation is kind of like this, kind of like the game of telephone. As the stories get told and retold, layers of meaning get added on that may or may not be true. So like those Russian Matryoshka or Babushka dolls, the dolls, you know, that stack and nest inside the other, our task in reading the Bible is to sometimes figure out how to get to the first layer of the text, or that innermost doll, right? The original one, the one without all the elaborate decorations and details. It will still be an interpretation, but how can we uncover what we feel God is telling us instead of solely relying on what others have told us for years, on what others have piled onto the text? As Larry Lauhead says, we need to hammer out our own faith. So case in point, have you seen the church marquee sign that says, Adam and Eve, the first people to not read the Apple terms and conditions? While it's a clever jab at our internet culture, whoever reads those terms and conditions before clicking the box and proceeding, it's a poor reading of our story today. After all, the text in Genesis never mentions an apple. And the woman and man were told clearly what the cause-effect relationship was when it came to the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They didn't have to read anything. There are just so many misconceptions about this text. This scene has been dubbed forever, it seems, as the fall. And it led to an entire doctrine called the Doctrine of Original Sin. Thank you, St. Augustine, in the 4th century. But even years and years before, in 200 BCE, the pseudepigraphic texts, which are not part of our current scriptures, they started retelling this story with the devil, or Satan, as the serpent. You see, these rumors started years ago, but among the rumors and various interpretations, the truth has always been in plain sight, even if hidden. There is no devil here, no Satan. There's just a man, a woman, and a serpent. Albeit a crafty serpent, mind you. Now, crafty is a legit translation for the Hebrew word here, but in English, we tend to put a negative connotation on it. Now, the word might be translated as sinister, as we see in the book of Job, but it can also be translated as sensible or prudent, as we see in Proverbs. It can have multiple meanings. So let's just say that the serpent is clever and talkative and is created by God, just like every other critter in the choir of God's creation. The serpent is no devil. The serpent is one of God's own creatures who simply poses some questions and alternative explanations about what God's motivations might be in keeping the humans from this tree. We're never told God's motivation, honestly, and neither is the serpent. And at any point in this conversation, the humans could have told the serpent that he was full of it and to please go and bother someone else. That is, if there had been other folks around to bother. But the serpent here, he doesn't make anyone do anything. It's not like the serpent bites the man or woman and puts the venom of suspicion into their blood. They are already inclined toward curiosity and suspicion. Else, why do they stick around to talk with the serpent? 
Now, the serpent's motive is unclear, too. I mean, what is in it for him? We don't know. But the bottom line is, the serpent is really just a conversation partner in this text, not a coercer. We can't place blame on others, not even way back in the beginning. God created us with agency and choice from the start. We so often blame others or point fingers at influences beyond our own heart and mind. But if nothing else, this text reminds us that we must always think for ourselves and be careful about what voices we are listening to. Not everything we hear is worth heeding, that's for sure. And there are serpents everywhere, even sometimes in the sound of voices we have been taught to trust, and even sometimes in the sound of our own voice. Now the other crazy thing about this story is that it's so often portrayed with the woman standing alone with this seductive serpent, but the man was present all along. When the woman and serpent speak, both use plural pronouns. In verse 3, the woman says, we may eat of all the fruit. And in response, the serpent says, you, and he uses the masculine plural form, you will not die. And even though it is the woman speaking, verse 7 indicates that the man was there all along. It says the woman eats and, quote, also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Now you could also make the case that the man failed to speak up, to speak out, and to join the woman in an alliance against the serpent's attempt to appeal to these suspicions and yearnings that were somehow already within the heart of the woman and man. In reality, culture has a lot to do with how stories are passed down, and patriarchy did women no favors with this one. But the point is, it is not the woman's fault. And fault really isn't the point anyway. Figuring out why they disobeyed God in the first place is the point, I think. I wonder if what has been hidden in plain sight is the fact that we humans have a tendency within us to resist limits. Why can't we eat of every single other tree in the garden and be satisfied? Why do we have to have the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil? Because in reality, we already know the difference between good and evil. And the woman and man knew right from wrong. The woman saw the fruit and saw that it was good even before she ate it. They knew what God had said, and yet they ate the fruit anyway. And even still, once they ate the fruit and, and became enlightened, so to speak, what is most distressing is to discover that knowing good and evil has little to do with whether we do good or do evil. I mean, we all know right from wrong, and yet we make the wrong choice a lot. Just one chapter later, one generation later, Cain will kill his brother Abel. He will do evil even as he knows it is wrong to do it. What does this say about our humanity? That we can know what we're supposed to do and how we're supposed to act, and yet still not do it. Well, as Old Testament scholar Patrick Miller says, the whole narrative of the primeval history flows out of this tension between being created like God and seeking to become God. One points to human possibility, the other to its plight. When we seek to become like God, we focus on the fact that, well, we are not God, and that we can't have everything that we want, or that we think we should have, or that we think we're entitled to. Think about this. The Garden of Eden is an expansive gift that God has given to the man and to the woman. They have everything they need, and then some, in the garden. But there is just one limit, 
one boundary they have to respect, one mandate to follow, one guideline, one. And what happens when they encounter this one limit in the midst of such expansive generosity and abundance? They push past it because they are focused on what they do not have rather than what they do have. It's as if when the woman and man take that bite of fruit that they are saying, God, all of this, it's not enough. We want more. This is the story of our humanity, isn't it? I mean, this is the story of the pandemic we're living in. It's just one example, but it's an ever-present one for us right now, right? I mean, you can go places and you can do things, but you just need to do this one thing. You need to wear a mask to protect and preserve life. But so many of us don't like this limit. We push past it. And what are the consequences of our overreach? Well, we're seeing it daily as we climb closer and closer to 200,000 people dead in our country from COVID. If nothing else, what this story reveals to me is that Genesis 3 shows us how soon we forget what God has told us in Genesis 1 and 2. We have forgotten our created identity and purpose. And when we forget these things, we start reaching in other directions for things that aren't the healthiest or best for us. We start trying to create a different narrative with voices other than the voice of God. And even though God never leaves us, all of a sudden we see only serpents. And we not only see them, we listen to them. And sometimes we become them as they tell us an alternative story to the story that God gave us in the beginning. I mean, you could call it fake good news if you wanted to. But the true story is this. We have more than enough because we are created from the Adamah, the fertile soil of the earth. God breathed God's self, Ruach, into the Adamah, the soil, and created Adam, man. Do you see that? The word man means soil, dirt. It doesn't get much more humbling than being formed from the dust of the earth. And even more, if it's also true that we are created in the image of God, the imago dei, as Genesis 1 tells us, then that means that God's image is somehow mixed up in the dirt too. The same dirt that's caked up in the soles of our shoes bears to the soul of God. If God's image is part of muck and mud, whether stardust from the heavens or sawdust from the earth, then what does that mean about our image and who we are? Well, dirt is not about perfection, is it? Dirt is about nourishment and growth and providing a hospitable environment for growth and life. There is no such thing as perfect dirt. Now, there is such a thing as rich soil, Soil that has what it needs to help seeds grow and flowers bloom and blossom. So if we're going to call this story the fall, then let's call it that because we're falling onto what we are made of from the beginning. Goodness and God's breath, right? Mess and muck, stardust and sawdust. If this story is about a fall, then it is about how sometimes we need to fall back onto the ground that we were created from so that we can be re-nurtured and nourished, so that we can be reminded of who we are and whose we are. This is a story about a garden, after all. What happens in a garden? Growth. Rather than a story about a fall from God's grace, I see this story as one where the soil is rich with God's grace, such that we are created with that grace, and when we mess up, God responds with grace. God puts us back into that grace so that we can get up and begin again. You know, we didn't read the rest of the story, but Genesis 3 ends with God not killing the woman and the man. God grants them grace. Now, they do get another limit imposed on them, a limit that they can't break this time. 
they have to leave the garden. They should have just stuck with the one tree as their limit, right? But nonetheless, even though the Garden of Eden is now off limits for them, the rest of the world is still theirs. There is still more than enough. Can the woman and man focus on that grace and generosity from God rather than focus on what they cannot have? Can we? Because here's the thing. Remembering our identity as created from the dust of the earth is just one part of the equation. The second part is remembering why we are here, what our calling is, our vocation. We learn in Genesis 2 that man was put in the garden to avod it and shamar it. These Hebrew words are often translated, translated as to till and to keep, but they have much stronger meanings. Avad is used all over the Old Testament and is most often used in the context of service or even slavery. This is how it's used in Joshua 24. As for me and my household, we will serve, we will avad the Lord. And shamar is also used a lot in the Old Testament. And it means to actively guard, to proactively and preemptively protect from harm. It's used six times in the eight verses of Psalm 121 to describe the God who guards Israel so closely that their foot will not slip and that the sun will not harm them by day nor the moon by night. This is the kind of obsessive, active protection and care described by the word shamar. So taken together then, these two Hebrew words in Genesis 2 translate to something closer like the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden to serve and protect it, care for it, right? We are created to serve and to protect and care for creation, to serve and to protect or preserve the natural world and our neighbor and ourselves. For the most part, we humans have served only one part of creation ourselves, our own species, and only part of our species at that. We have tilled and worked and produced and built and developed so much that the earth has suffered and creation has suffered and certainly other creatures have suffered, but most of all humanity has suffered. Life is lost every day because we are more devoted to keeping our lifestyle than we are to keeping God's commandment to serve and protect the earth and one another. What are we doing to ourselves and our world? And in turn, what are we doing to our God? Well, we are acting as God by not caring for how we treat creation. And in so doing, we are doing evil even though we know better. Think of how many people say that they experience God's presence in nature, right? In creation. Many of us do. If this is the case, why are we exploiting the very place so many of us experience God's presence? Well, we do so because it makes our lives more convenient and because we think we have to keep producing and consuming, right? It's all we know. Sometimes we are so ingrained in our habits and culture, we need a hard stop to wake us up. I'd say that we're in the midst of that hard stop right now with COVID-19. What has it taught us? What will it teach us? Is there anything hidden in plain sight that we need to unearth, that we need to rediscover, rediscover that we need to recommit to, that we need to reprioritize now that we have recalled that our purpose is to serve and protect creation and one another. Like the woman and the man in this story, our eyes are opened. We can see all we need to see. We may not know everything, but we know everything we need to know. And even as we may feel ashamed or embarrassed about our actions, as we see in the story, God calls us out of shame and into significance. Our choices do not define us. We always have a second chance. 
Our turning from God will always and forever lead back to God turning to us. The circle of God's grace is never unbroken. It turns out that God never abandons us or our created goodness. We have not fallen out of God's graces. We've just maybe buried that understanding of goodness. We've run from it. We've ignored it. We've denied it. We've hid from it. Can we discover it anew yet again? You know, hospice chaplains see the many different things that people do to prepare for the death they know is coming. Family visits, long delayed trips, letters of reconciliation and forgiveness, getting financial affairs in order. These are all familiar preparations for death. One woman, though, found peace through a different kind of preparation. When I die, she said, pointing to the shelves in her closet, Each of my three children will receive nine bound volumes of my genealogical research. For her, the best way to prepare for an uncertain future was to examine the past and to know her roots and to pass those along to her children. As we begin a new program year, and an uncertain school year, and an uncertain election year, the narrative lectionary takes us back to the beginning to tell us who we are and what our calling is. Our identity and purpose are hidden in plain sight in this text. Don't let years of other voices and interpretations about sin and shame bury you alive. Know this truth. You are created in God's image from God's breath and from the earth's dust. And however God created you, you have something to offer this world, some way to serve, some way to care for others, for animals, for our planet, for yourself. We are made with love so that we might go out and love others. Hidden. In plain sight in this text is our original goodness and God's ever-present grace. That is your beginning. It is my beginning. It is our story because it is God's story. And no matter how many times we have to begin again, may we never tire of telling this story. Amen.